What's up guys, Kyle here again, and it is, again, Fackin' Friday, again, again, again. First off, in case you guys missed it, Wednesday night, Rev Amplification finally announced their new gate. It's called the gate. Clever. Rev sent me this pedal in order for me to try it out a couple weeks before the release, and I can say it is a great pedal. Go over to their website and check it out. Rev did not pay me to say this. I just figured that I would let you guys know because I have used it and it is a good gate. So if that's something you're in the market for, head on over to Rev Amplification and check this baby out. Hope you guys have been having a good week so far. If you haven't yet, I started a new channel last Friday, not gear related at all, but it's more of like a diet and fitness type thing where I'm documenting my experiences with the carnivore diet. I know I've mentioned it on a couple of episodes and talked to you guys about it before, but I have gone back on the strict carnivore diet as of last week, and I am doing a vlog channel to document my experiences with it. So if that's anything you guys are interested in, I'm gonna put the link to the new channel down below. So go ahead and check it out. Subscribe to it if it's something that you're interested in. If not, I'll still be here. And with that stuff out of the way, let's jump into your guys' questions for the week. First question comes from Joshua Helton, and he asks, I got an iPad. Have you ever tried the PV Windsor? Got one for under $200 a while ago, and used it for a pop punk band and didn't think it was too bad. Thanks for your question, Joshua. Yes, I actually have owned a number of the Windsors. I personally have never been a fan of them for a couple of reasons. Number one, they are just very thin sounding amps to my ears. They have no balls whatsoever and they tend to get even thinner the louder that you turn them up because even though it's a 100 watt amp, the power section seems to be uh, maybe a little bit under spec, maybe the transformers, I'm not exactly sure, but it just always sounded like a pretty weak amp to me. So on top of that, it's supposed to be like this modded JCM 800 type of circuit. I hear similarities, but overall it's pretty different sounding in my opinion. It's got a lot of gain for an 800 style circuit, but it's a little bit muddy. And when you try to boost it, the front end of that amp does not handle a boost whatsoever. It like completely overloads it. And it, it gives it this weird, like almost like fluctuation in volume where you hit it real hard and the amp compresses super hard. So it goes, wow, 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 wow. I don't know. Yeah, it does that, it does that. That's the scientific uh, definition of what's going on there. But yeah, I just could never quite get it where I wanted it for the metal stuff. Now I could see if you were playing something where you weren't trying to max out the gain or you weren't trying to push the front amp of this uh, front end of the amp super hard, front amp of the end, you know, you don't wanna push the front amp of the end. If you're not trying to push the front end of the amp hard with a boost or a really hot pickup, that yeah, it could, it could be a decent amp, especially like you said, they used to go for like, 200 bucks all day long, but the prices on them recently, they've jumped up to around $300, sometimes even more than $300. So at those prices, I'm just, I'm not willing to play, honestly. If I can find one for like 150 bucks or even cheaper, maybe one that's like broken for like $50 and take it to uh, Wagner Amp Repair down the road here in Erie and maybe have him put like a, a better output transformer in it and perform a couple mods so I'm not into it for too much, then I could see it being kind of a cool investment. But otherwise, as it stands now, I will get one on the channel if I can find one at some point because a lot of people have requested it and they want to know my opinions on it. But as I've said a couple times in the past, I'm not a huge fan of the amp in stock form, but hopefully we will be able to get one here on the channel and get belligerent belligerent oh, i'm gonna give up and get belligerent with it at some point ah! chris fisher asks hey love your videos thank you sir can you tell us what gear and settings you use on the ronin album that is a killer tone i have answered this before but i am always happy to talk about the gear that i used on my band's full length so i'm gonna answer it again so for my band bushido codes full length the ronin on my side i used my spawn super sport 50 kt88 and an EVH 5153 50 watt model. Those amps blend incredibly well, especially for the type of sound that I personally am going for. I like the modded Marshall thing, but with a bit of a modern edge to it. So for that exact purpose, that's why those amps pair very well together. Now for the cabinets that I used for the Splawn, I actually recorded the Splawn through a Friedman cabinet. Dude, I'm, oh, I'm struggling. I recorded the Splawn through a Friedman cabinet and actually mic'd up the greenback. We didn't mic up the V30 in the Friedman cab. And then I recorded the EVH through my Splawn cab and we mic'd up a V30 that's in the Splawn cab. For the boost out front, I used a KHDK Ghoul Screamer 
And for the guitar, I used just a Gibson Les Paul Studio Faded because I've said many times how much I love the Faded series of guitars from Gibson. I think they're a great value. They're very resonant and lively. I, I think that they're the best sounding Gibsons and they're among the cheapest, but that's just my personal opinion. And I stuck the Seymour Duncan Mark Holcomb Alpha and Omega pickups in that guitar to give it kind of like a nice modern chunk. And man, that combo, I'm, I'm super happy with my guitar tone. If you guys listen to the album, my tones are mainly on the right side. On Derek's side, he used a Spawn Quick Rod KT88, or it's a Pro Mod. He used a Pro Mod, I believe. His is a Pro Mod, which is basically a Quick Rod with KT88 tubes in it. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't get Spawn's naming structure. I love their amps. Don't quite understand why he named them the way that they did. Yeah, so he recorded that amp through his Spawn cabinet that had Eminence, I believe, Manowar Wizards. Yeah, Manowar and Wizards are what are in his cab. SM57's on all these speakers. He also used a Chariotone Chupacabra that's ever so slightly blended in. You can't hear it very much, but it was just to add a little bit of saturation as the Spawn signal can be a little dry. And that cab went through my, or that amp went through my Spawn cab with the Vintage 30 being mic'd by an SM57. He had his Gibson Les Paul Traditional with a bare knuckle painkiller, and he also used the KHDK Ghoul Screamer. So, that's what we used to get the guitar tones on that album. I honestly couldn't be happier with the way that the, the tones came out on that album. I think they sound fantastic. So probably be using a similar setup whenever we were go to record some new stuff, which uh, isn't far off. DR440 asks, I'm curious, what was the first guitar you ever owned? Mine was a real piece of S. But since I was only 10 at the time, I thought it ruled. Thanks for your question, man. That's a good one. Um, so the first guitar I ever owned was a piece of crap acoustic. It was like a, like a classical acoustic style guitar that had the, uh, the open slots and the headstock with the goofy tuners. My grandfather bought that for me. I have no idea where he got it, but I had been asking my parents for a guitar for over a year and they refused to buy me one. So my grandfather got me one for Christmas and here we are. But yeah, that guitar was absolutely terrible. Even then, I knew that it was terrible because I had played on my friends' other acoustic guitars who had like cheap Washburns and stuff like that. And even those were miles better than what I had, but it served its purpose. I learned how to play on that guitar. And a year later, the next Christmas, when I was 13, 12 or 13, my parents bought me a Squire Affinity Fat Strat and a Rogue 20 watt practice amp. So the Squire Affinity Fat Strat was the only guitar that I had from the age of 12 all the way to 17, I believe. At the time, I was really into Green Day and Blink-182, and I ended up somehow buying a Duncan Invader, having my friend solder it in. He didn't solder it in correctly, so it sounded like crap after the pickup got put in, and that guitar basically sat for a while anyways, because I ended up, uh, as I mentioned on my last episode, broke my hand a bunch of times, so for about two years, uh, I couldn't even play guitar if I wanted to. So yeah, my first real electric guitar was a Squire Affinity Fat Strat, which I loved to death. I ended up selling it to a girl I worked with when I was like 20. And then I ended up seeing it in the window of a pawn shop a few months after that. <laughs> and I really wanted to buy it back. But at the time I was literally sleeping on a friend's uh, bedroom floor because I had no place to live and I was poor and broke. So that didn't happen. No idea where it is now. Kind of wish I still had it, but uh, you know, I'm sure pretty much every guitarist can relate to a similar story like that. So yeah, Squire Affinity Fat Strat was the first guitar that I technically count. Harry Canyon, back again with another crucial question, asks, what's your take on the digital units such as the Kemper, the Helix, the Quad Cortex, etc.? Thank you for your question, man. Um, I actually was not even interested in the digital stuff for the longest time. I really had no desire to check it out. I mean, when I was really young, I had like a Digitech pedal and then when I started playing guitar again around the age of 20, I bought a Digitech RP, uh, RP500 or 1000, whatever their like main one was at the time. It was a really big pedal and thought it was cool, but I had a 6505 and I was just like, man, this just doesn't even compare to the 6505. So from that point on, I was not interested in the digital stuff. Uh, the Axe FX came out shortly after that. And then the Kemper not long after that. And just recently, 
I got, I gained some interest in it again. And right now I have most of the main modelers at my disposal. I have a quad cortex. I have a helix uh, that I actually just posted a video on yesterday where I ran it through the two power section of my Mezza Barba and got some really, really awesome tones out of it. I actually was really happy with, with how that thing sounded. So check that video out if you guys haven't watched it. But I've also got a Pod Go, which is mine uh, that I bought and I'm going to keep, as well as a Kemper, as well as a Head Rush gig board. So I've got a bunch of modeling units at my disposal right now. I can say the technology has come a long ways. And for a person like me who's not necessarily looking to use it as an all-in-one type device like they're mainly meant to be used where you play it through a powered speaker or you go direct to the front of house or you plug it directly into your auto audio interface for recording i'm not super interested in those use purposes what i'm interested in is the portability aspect portability portability utility portability portobello mushrooms i'm still hungry the portability of a unit like that because my band, believe it or not, does play overseas sometimes, not very often, but it does happen. And every time I've had to do that, I've had to borrow gear that sounded bad. And uh, I kind of just want to be able to throw a unit on a pedal board with a power amp and throw it in my duffel bag. And that is my rig. And I don't have to worry about gear for the entirety of the tour because everything is mine. So I don't have to worry about anything breaking or anything going wrong with it. And I can get the tones that I want to get out of it as opposed to trying to make do with somebody else's stuff. So for me, that is where the use case is. Or if I'm traveling, like say we've got a show in California and we're going to fly out there. Not something that really happens very often, but it has the potential to happen. And we've done it before where we've had to travel a long ways in a small car or something. That pedal board rig would be amazing because then I could just show up I can even borrow somebody else's tube amp, and if it's an amp that I don't like, well, I can just run the PV Panama SIM out of the Line 6 Pod Go that I paid 300 bucks for and get a really convincing PV5150 tone. So, I mean, that's, that's where I find it useful. That's where a type of guy like me who's not necessarily interested in having every amp model and every effect and having a thousand different presets. I don't care about that stuff. I just care about having a few good tones that I can tap into when needed and that I can take with me easily. So that is my take on the digital modeling stuff. Is it 100% there? No. Is it close enough that you can actually get away with it and have a good guitar tone and be satisfied with what's coming out of the speakers behind you? Absolutely, man, absolutely. Again, check that Helix video out that I posted yesterday. I, I got a lot of great tones out of that thing, so I was really happy with that. That's my take on the current situation as far as modelers and profilers go. All right, last question comes from my man, Graham Resington, and he actually has an awesome YouTube channel where he checks out a lot of the really cool plugins and does a great job with those. So go ahead over and check his channel out when you guys get a second. I would really appreciate it, and I'm sure he would too, and I think you guys would get some value out of it for sure. Graham asks, what are your honest thoughts on different power tube types? Great question. As you know, there has been a lot of stuff, especially on YouTube lately, regarding power tubes and how little difference they make. So here is my quick take on it because I don't want to dive too deep into this, but if you are going from power tube type to power tube type, like say e, uh, 6L6 family to EL34 family, you're going to notice a difference for sure. Is it going to be massive? Not necessarily. Some amps definitely react more to power tube changes than others. Some, it's almost indistinguishable when you change power tube types. Others, you'll notice a pretty big difference. But for the most part, you're not going to hear a night and day difference. You're not going to transform an amp into something that it is not by changing the power tube. So keep that in mind. You're not going to take a dual rectifier and slap E34L power tubes in it, which are some of my favorites right now. Not EL34s, E34Ls, which are a bigger, tighter sounding EL34 and make it a super tight metal machine just by swapping those, those power tubes. It's not going to happen. Will you get a slightly tighter sound and reaction out of it? Yes, but again, it's still very much going to be a dual rectifier. It's not going to be anything crazy. So that's where I see most of the differences coming from when you're swapping power tube types is going from one family of power tubes to another. Now, Within the same family, especially with 6L6, because there's not a ton of different types of 6L6s out there at the moment being produced. So if you're going from like a, a Ruby 6L6 to a Softex 6L6, you're probably not going to be able to discern the differences for the most part. And if you can, you might be able to tell by yourself, but I guarantee you will not be able to tell in a band mix 
playing with friends or even if there's just another guitarist around and you guys are blending tones, like it's going to be such a minute difference that it's not going to be worth your time. The only time it's really worth it to change your power tubes and possibly experiment with a different brand or something like that is if the power tubes in your amp are already dying. They do get old, they do start to sound weak. Then you change them and you'll probably notice a pretty significant difference. But as it stands right now, switching from one 6L6 to another 6L6 or an EL34 to another EL34 or even a KT77 or something like that, you're not gonna notice a big enough difference for it to have been worth the $100 or more if you have to take it to a tech to bias it if you don't have the ability to do that yourself. So yeah, I just, I don't think that they're a worthy investment. I think pickups, overdrive pedals if you're a metal guy, and most importantly, speakers are gonna make much more of a difference than swapping your power tubes ever will. And guess what? Pickups and overdrives, they're around the same price as a set of power tubes. So 100 bucks for a set of power tubes versus $100 for a new bridge pickup versus $100 for a different overdrive. I'm gonna take the pickup or the overdrive 10 out of 10 times before I switch the power tubes in my amp. That's just my perspective. All right, guys, another great episode gone by. Thank you so much for your support as of late. The channel's doing great. I am having a great time, and I love interacting with you guys, as I always say. For next week, put your down... God... Oh, put your comments down below in the comment section. I screwed it up again. Oh, my God. Put your questions for next week down below in the comment section, for the love of God. I'm spitting everywhere. If you would be so kind as to mosey on down to the description of this video, Click on that Sweetwater affiliate link if you guys are planning on buying anything anytime soon. You get something nice from the fine folks at Sweetwater and I get a little kickback that helps me out and helps this channel grow. Also consider becoming a member of my Patreon and supporting the channel that way. There's also my Discord server, my Facebook group. Consider joining the belligerent amateur community where we can talk gear all day long. Thanks so much for being here, guys. Kyle here again. We'll see you guys next time.